Whilst there are some people in the graphic design space doing so, I think I'm the only person in the Linux space actively covering GIMP3 development, and I have been doing so for multiple years now, and that doesn't even scratch the surface for how long we've been waiting for GIMP3 to release. I use this application on a near daily basis. It is incredibly important to my content creation workflow, and some of the features in GIMP3, I don't think we should have had to wait for GIMP3 for. They should have been in the project over a decade ago. But you know what? Better late than never. Now, a couple of months ago, there was a new schedule released. This gave us an indication when things should actually be done. Everything should be done before May 9th. Now, I don't think May 9th is going to happen because we have just hit another deadline and they're a little bit late to meeting that one. That being the release of the final development preview 2.99.18. This was supposed to be out mid February. So they're a couple of days late being on the 21st. Not like crazy late, but specifically May 9th. I don't know if that's going to happen. Either way, though, maybe June. Look, I know it's copium, but like, let me have my copium. It's been years now. Now, as always, testing and bug reports are appreciated. We remind that a development version means this is a release to show work in progress, but also give an opportunity to the community to detect issues early and report issues. In other words, this is an unstable version and we do not recommend it to use in production. Use it because you want to help GIMP improve by reporting bugs. This version, 2.99.18 in particular, might be the most unstable releases in the 2.99 series because of the space invasion, that being their whole rework of the color system. It is expected and normal. This color rework is a big part of the reason why everything has taken so long, because it's one thing to convert a GTK2 application up to GTK3 when you're at the scale of GIMP. But the color rework basically is making GIMP's color system actually function. What I mean is for GIMP's entire life, it was completely unsuitable for any sort of professional color work. Yeah, you can make some memes and yeah, you can make some YouTube thumbnails. But if you need to do stuff with print, you need those colors to be consistent. You need the colors that you use on the computer to be the colors that you are going to print. And that wasn't the case. Lately, we have been porting older internal color structures, GIMP RGB, GIMP CMYK, GIMP HSV, which we use to carry color information to Gaggle Color. This generic object can contain any color data regardless of the color model, precision, or space supported by Babel, our pixel encoding engine. What it means for color correctness in particular is that we will now do color conversion only when needed, last second conversion, and therefore won't lose information when it could have been avoided. For instance, say you color pick from an image, if we were to convert to an intermediate format before using it on the second image, which may or may not be in another color format, we'd do two conversions, which means more possibility of precision loss. The issue is more flagrant if the input and output formats are the same i.e. no conversion should happen at all, and this will be even more of a problem when we'll have core CMYK backend. We really want to avoid doing a round trip to intermediate format with CMYK, which doesn't have bijective conversion with most other color models, even when working unbounded and ignoring precision issues. Basically, you don't want to be changing between these different formats unless you absolutely need to. Any conversion is going to be a problem. It might not be a major problem, and it might not matter for things that don't really matter. But again, in print, it is really, really important to have correct colors. We are also slowly moving stored data to this generic color object. In particular, it means that color palettes will be able to contain CMYK colors, CIE lab colors, or in any other supported model, and not only these colors, after a conversion to unbounded sRGB. 
And this doesn't just make it better for the users, it makes it easier for the developers, because now you don't have to deal with all of this extra casing to deal with these additional types of colors. You are just working with the color object, and all of that stuff, if you're not dealing with it right now, can be done by somebody else. Lastly, we are working towards showing color space information in various parts of the interface, when relevant, such as when displaying or choosing RGB, CMYK, HSL or HSV data. Values in these color models without the associated color space are near meaningless. Interface displaying values in RGB without further information are a remnant of the past when it mostly meant sRGB. This is clearly not true anymore in modern graphic work, and the interface should make it clear. Basically, give the user information about what color space they are working with. Very simple stuff. They also have this super laggy video showing off what this interface looks like. So we have the profile right here, we have the profile right here, and in this bigger color picker they have, we also have the profile right here. Basically, anywhere that you're dealing with the colors, it's gonna say, hey, here's the colors. Again, very simple stuff that probably should have always been there. For my use cases, this doesn't really affect me, but, the next part does. Initial non-destructive layer effects. As in, you can apply an effect to an image and then toggle that on and off. You can rearrange the effects and the underlying image isn't being changed. This was not supposed to ship with 3.0. It was originally planned for the 3.2 roadmap, but it is ahead of schedule. Now, a reason why you might want to use this, for filter effects such as blur, it means that layer effects are kept separate from the layer pixels. This means that if later on you want to change a setting, rearrange, or even remove the filter, you can easily do so without affecting the rest of the image. Until now, GIMP has followed a destructive editing workflow where effects were immediately merged down onto the layer, so this is a major change. Previously, if you wanted to undo an effect, you would have to undo all the way back through your undo tree, undoing all of the other work you were doing. Now, the effects are treated separate. On my thumbnails, you probably see I have white outlines around myself and around logos, and then a shadow behind the text. All of these things, I have a perfected thing that I never need to touch, because if I need to mess around with that, I need to undo stuff, and just a giant mess. But this allows me to very easily modify things as I go, and basically experiment with a lot more thumbnail designs without completely wasting my time. Any Gaggle operation, Gaggle being their graphic processing library that has a GUI, is now applied to layers non-destructively. I don't know of any that don't have that, at least in the workflow that I have. Non-destructive effects for layer masks and channels are planned for future updates. This includes third-party Gaggle plugins, which is massive for me because that's primarily what I use, and custom operations created by a Gaggle graph tool. These effects can be saved and loaded in XCF project files, that being the GIMP project file, although not all Gaggle properties are supported in the current build. Hopefully everything that I use is, but I'm not certain. Like there is a visibility eye next to each of the layers, when you apply an effect to a layer, there's also going to be this little glasses icon. If you click on that, that is what is going to let you select each of the individual effects, toggle them on and off, and also rearrange them. And of course, if you don't want them anymore, also delete them. Note that this is only an early implementation and much work remains to be done for a full featured version of non-destructive editing. Whilst that may be the case, for what I do, this is everything I need. I'm very happy I'm not going to need to wait until 3.2 to actually get this feature, because that's probably going to be three, four years from now. Now, I don't agree with every single change. Under the font handling improvements, GIMP no longer relies on font names being unique to distinguish between them. This means it won't append one, two, and so on, but instead keep the original names in the font selection list. Despite the apparent name clash, both identically named fonts will now work properly. This is horrible, because now if you have identically named fonts, you have to just select between them to find which font you actually want. Whereas previously, it would have one, two, and so on, so you can easily tell which font is which. 
This is something that should absolutely be toggleable. These changes though are pretty good. The XCF saving code now stores font information much more accurately, which helps to avoid loading the wrong font when opening some XCF. Personally, I've never seen this problem, but maybe it's an issue if you use a lot of different fonts. Alignment of text in text layers for right to left languages is now more consistent with how it works in other software such as LibreOffice and Scribus. This is great. It's always great when applications actually properly support right to left languages. I don't write in one, but for users who do, it's good for them. Now here's something I'd never consider the feature, auto expanding layers. So do you ever increase the size of your canvas and not the size of your layer? You're using a brush, you're doing a selection, all of this sort of stuff, and you get to the edge of the layer and then you can't do anything else there. Well, with an auto expanding layer, if you then try to do something outside of it, it just automatically expands the layer out. Keep in mind, this video is really laggy for some reason. I don't know why. Now, what the background is made of is going to be configurable. So if you don't want a white background here, you don't need one. If you want it to be transparent instead, that is going to be an option. I will probably enable this and then never think about it again, but it's not going to be a massive workflow changer. Something that is are the new snapping options because I have been using these ever since I've been using GIMP. However, I've been faking them using guides and this is going to make it so much easier. The first option is snap to bounding boxes. Dynamic guides will show you when the layer you're moving is aligned with the center or sides of others. The active layer will also snap to those boundaries to assist with arranging them properly. So if you want things to be perfectly lined up, you can just drag them and line them up instead of using a guide to do so. This is a feature that has existed in applications like PowerPoint and Word for so many, many years. Thank you for finally doing this. Thank you, Mr. Fantastic, a new contributor who added something really, really cool. The second option is snap to equidistance or equidistance, I actually don't know how to say it, which allows you to snap between three layers that are equidistant apart from each other. Basically, three things that are equal distance. I don't know why it's using equidistant here. Three things that are equal distant apart. So if you want to have three columns that are equally distant, you can just do it without having to do the maths. Once again, thank you. This is so useful. There are some other nice little changes in here regarding themes, new default themes, a new welcome dialog, various file system format improvements, and some new file format improvements, some various changes regarding better tablet support. So when a tablet is plugged in, you can now assign different actions to the tablet controls via the input device dialog under the edit menu. So previously, you could already bind actions to the tablet, but you'd have to do it in this two-step process. So you bind an action in GIMP to a hotkey, and then you bind a button on your tablet to a hotkey, and then the hotkey runs from the tablet and runs the action in GIMP. Now the action can be directly bound to the tablet itself. It's also very important to note that GIMP 3, with all of these changes that are happening, are going to have some pretty significant API changes. So we are planning to write and release tutorial for plugin writers in the resource development section of our developer website at the same time as the GIMP3 release or not long after. So unless plugin developers are just winging it or using a system that isn't really changing that much, like Giggle, for example, yeah, there's not going to be any plugins available for GIMP3. It's going to take a bit of time for this to be filled out. Look, I'm sure some will work it out pretty quickly, but don't expect major things off the start. There are a lot more little changes going on, and I know I've said it before, and maybe I shouldn't say it again, and I know it's copium, but we have this schedule, and it looks like this year is actually going to be the release of GIMP 3. If we actually get RC1 in the middle of March or late March, I will finally finally just not stop say I know I'm already not, not going to stop saying it, but like, I will actually believe and it won't be coping if we actually get RC1. I hope it happens. I really do. It's been so many, so many years and this needs to end.
But what do you think? Are you still on the copium train? Do you think it's actually going to happen? Or do you think it's time to give up? I would like to know. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really liked the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, Scribe, Silly Bear Pay linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me. And just let me believe.